uh, we want to welcome you also. I wanted to start, uh, before we actually get into today's lesson, to uh, just touch base a little bit about some of Jeff's uh, lesson last week. One of the significant elements uh, of Jeff's lesson last week was the branch. What is the branch? Okay, you guys, you, this was just last week. What, what is the branch? What's its significance? Jesus. Jesus, I'm sorry, what? Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Okay, excellent. Yes, the branch bears fruit. Specifically, when we're talking in these prophecies, we are talking about the coming Messiah. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to deviate just a little bit, and, uh, and Jeff said I could do it. I suggested it, actually. Which, which I was going to do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Last night in our small group, we were studying in Zechariah, and we were in Zechariah chapter 6. Uh, and I want, to read, I want to read two verses out of it. Uh, with the teaching last week about the branch and the expectation uh, that the prophet gives to, to the people, uh, the best is yet to come. That was how we closed off our lesson last night, that the best is yet to come. I'm reading from Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11. And what's going to happen at that point in time is uh, in Zechariah uh, the word of the Lord is given, and that's in the beginning of chapter 1. And then for the next uh, rest of chapter 1 and start of chapter 6 are eight visions. And so the prophet sees a scene laid out in front of him. And often he says, well, what means these? And the angel of the Lord, the narrating angel, gives him insight. But these scenes are, are laid out, and they're symbolic, and, and they teach something. When we get beyond the, the, these visions, uh, we get into, and the word of the Lord came uh, to the prophet. Now, this is direct revelation. This is God speaking specifically what he wants them to hear. And he's going to tell them to go to these three dudes, totally unknown names, who came out of exile, and go to the house of a fourth, and, and we really don't know anything about these guys, and get some of the gold and the silver. And this gold and silver had come back from Babylon. All right? The king had allowed them to bring thousands and thousands of, of pieces of gold and silver for the temple. All right, And then it says, take silver and gold, make an ornate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And I want to bring that up for just a minute because typically in the Old Testament, who wore a crown? The king. The king. The king. It's a symbol of authority. It's a symbol of stature. Okay? In this case, the crown is to be made and put on the high priest. And this is an important concept. It's to be put on the, on the high priest. And then it says in verse 12, Then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. This ties back to where Jeff was last week. The promises of the coming Messiah are, are throughout the Old Testament, and they're powerful. And when the, when the, when the Messiah comes, he is going to come as, pro, as priest and king. One in one person, and he will sit on the throne. And we know as we go on from there that the best is, is yet to come. So I just wanted to bring that up, tying in where Jeff was last week with the branch. Uh, when you read about that, when you think about, when you hear that, think Messiah. And then when you think about that, think about how God plans to take Jesus after the order of Melchizedek, the priest, and Jesus, who sits on the throne of David forever, as one, uh, as, as, our, as our priest and our king. So now we're going to get into uh, Isaiah. We're going to start in chapter 5, verse 1. Jeff, please open us with prayer. Yeah. Oh, Father, we thank you that the branch has come. Yes. Our king, the one king that we look to and in whom we trust. We thank you, king of kings and lord of lords. And we thank you, high priest, the one who has taken away our sin, 
by offering a sacrifice, not the blood of bulls and goats, which can never finally take away sin, but his one and only life, his own lifeblood. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us, Lamb of God, the precious and perfect sacrifice. So we look to you as our King and High Priest, and we pray for John today as he teaches us that you would anoint him, empower him, strengthen him, and help him. And we pray for ourselves that we would be active listeners and able to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first four chapters of Isaiah, what kind of comments or descriptions has the prophet been given has God given to the prophet to describe the nation of Israel? And, and when I say the nation of Israel, we are talking about Judah at this point in time. What kind of phraseologies has he used? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? That's the correct answer, but why? Absolutely. What else? He, I, I have a table set up for you over here. Okay. Um, their behavior. Their behavior. And he even gets to the point where he says, your offerings are vanity. And it's even to the point that if you try to pray to me, yeah, I, I'm not going to hear. And I think it was at that point in time, Bob, where are you, Bob? You had said, yeah, you didn't listen to me. Why should I listen to you? And, and you know, that's basically the indictment against it. We get into chapter uh, 5, and um, we'll go around. If I point to you and you say, I'd rather not, we'll just move on. Sandy, you're going to be my Isaiah 5 person, so you don't have to look anywhere else. Uh, Nancy, uh, would you be willing to read when we get there somewhere? Would you, would you be willing to read a passage out of the Bible for us? Oh, sure. All right, you're going to get Psalm 80. Sandy, show her where that is. Kimberly, Hosea 10. And Bob, Jeremiah 2, and Louise, Ezekiel 15. So Sandy, give me uh, a verse 1 of chapter 5. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. So we're just going to look at the first half of that verse, because I, I the... Emotions that are coming out of this beginning uh, just flow through the rest of the chapter. So just filling in my blanks, let me do what? Sing. Sing. For who? My beloved. And then it goes on to say that my beloved had a vineyard. If we try to put the pronouns there, let me sing, me, that's the prophet, Isaiah, let me sing uh, for my beloved, and that, that would be referring, referring to God. How would you describe the prophet's heart through the first phrase of the first verse? Loving. Loving. It, and loving who? The people. Mm. In this particular case, he's saying, let me sing for my beloved, which is God. Yeah. The prophet's emotions and the prophet's focus right now, he is in love with God. And it's going to flow out um, into, just into a, a feeling of worship, a love song concerning his vineyard. When the prophet sings, he's expressing his heart. When the prophet sings, the implication of a song, what's the implication of a song? What is this? To God? To God? Yes. It's joy. It's joy. I'm sorry. Sorry. Form of expression. Yep. Form of expression. It's, it's, it's something, it, it's one thing to be sitting in the, in, in the quiet of your prayer closet and, 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 and praying to God in your heart. That's, that's I, I, I totally encourage that. Turn that into actually audibly proclaiming these words of praise. It, there's a certain sense of elevation of your heart. There's a certain sense of elevation of these emotions. Uh, there's almost no better way to, to perceive something to be true than to actually say it out loud. And, and he's saying here that let me sing for my beloved. 
What's going on right now is the, is the prophet is in love with God to the extent that he, he really can't hold it back. He has to, he just has to belt it out. I would ask you to ask Jeff to sing, but I don't think he wants to. I was actually singing in my office yesterday, Psalm 22, just to try to hear that, because it said it's like a, a giddeth, which is a, to, the, to the tune of the doe of the morning. So I thought, Psalm 22 as a song? Because that's, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Tongue sticking to the roof of my mouth. So I tried to sing that, and it was brutal. I was terrible. It is really hard to put that into a song, John. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. As you tried to put it into a song, what did that do for your heart it, and for your spirit? I connected with that more than ever. Yeah, to sing the Psalms is, yeah, powerful, even if you can't sing. It reminds me of this verse in Ephesians 5, 519, Amen. It is a great thing for you to do and not to be embarrassed to do it. If you're doing it on your own, nobody else could hear Jeff. But he was alone in the building. But he's <laughs> belting it out. How many of you have ever sung in the shower? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. All day. Uh, There you go. <laughs> We've got the prophet right now who is singing to his beloved, and it says that it is his love song concerning what? His vineyard. His vineyard. Okay, he is acknowledging God's sovereign ownership. Now, we're going to talk about the vineyard and, and what that represents in a minute. Uh, but he is, in his love song, he's saying this vineyard belongs to Yahweh. It is, it is, it is his, it's his to do with, but it's also because the vineyard is his, this vineyard should have a response to the keeper. Yeah. It should have, should have both. Sandy, give me one and two again, please. also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. Let's talk about this vineyard for a minute. And again, we're talking about my beloved, we're talking about God. And it says that my beloved has a, don't make it tough, it's just right in the scripture. My beloved has a vineyard. We'll talk about that in a minute. Where is this vineyard? on a fertile hill. All right. Now, he has done several things in allowing this vineyard to flourish. He's done what to the land? Cleared it. Cleared it. Now, now, we can talk about that. We could probably spend the entire time talking about it. Why does the land have to be cleared? Let's, let's, anybody here ever grow up or work on a farm? Okay, I can say anything I want and you won't know if I'm right or not. <laughs> I will say this from my, from my studies. In, in New England, as, as the pilgrims were establishing uh, their farms and stuff, in the fields were rocks. Well, and weeds, yes. Rocks that had to get out of there. And so if, if, you, if you hike through New England you're going to see these stone walls surrounding the fields. Those were the rocks that were inside, and they got in the way. That's, that's what those rocks, and they, they had to do something with them, so they made stone walls to surround, to surround their fields. It says that Jesus took the land that his vineyard would occupy and cleared it. What did he have to get out of there? And what do they represent? The 
Great answer. Sin. Sin. Canaanites. Any influence that could have disrupted the, the healthy growth of the vine, he, he removed it. Now, I, I go back in my mind, I, I get, when, I, when I get to take the pulpit, I'm preaching out of Joshua. Jericho, who, won the, who fought the battle of Jericho? And it's not Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, even though we sing that little ditty, God fought the battle of Jericho. Joshua, they just walked around and watched what happened. They left that, and the next obstacle was Ai. Who fought the first battle of Ai? The Israelites. The Israelites. They lost. And they lost. Oh, yeah. Because of Achan. Well, because of Achan, there were, there were four major sins there, and one was Achan and, and his uh, greed, but another was the Israelites, and they didn't accept the sovereignty of God. God cleared the land. The people didn't clear the land. God cleared the land. And then it said, what did he plant? Choice vines. And there's a beautiful thought, too. He took his people, his chosen people, and he put them in this land that he had already prepared and he had already cleared for them. And then what did he build? Watchtower. watchtower. What, what's the watchtower for? To watch the plants grow? No. What's the watchtower for? To make sure that you still plant, you know, weeds attack the fruit and they steal the fruit and make sure somebody doesn't come in and destroy it. Mm. All of these are right. There, there, there are things that are going to uh, hamper the, the growth, and, and it could be an enemy planting weeds, or it could be wild animals uh, devouring, or it could be a marauder coming in. Any of these things, the watchtower, once the plant has been, land has been cleared, once the choice vines have been planted, the watchtower watches over this vine as it grows because of all of these bad things that could possibly happen to it. And then he says, what else did he make? Wine. What's the wine press? Uh, yeah. Now, there's some interesting pictures there, too. What happens to the grape when it goes into... It gets smashed. <laughs> it gets crushed. You know, there, yeah, there's a lot of uh, strong pictures there, too. The, it, we... Bearing fruit in of ourselves are not necessarily what God... God may be putting us into, into a wine press you know, for his things. Pastor Jeff and I were talking uh, this morning and praising God for whatever may come out of this election. And if he's needing to put us into a wine press or put us into the refining fire, I go gladly. Yeah, I, I go gladly. These are the things that God did for this vineyard that he calls his own. And it says he watched because he anticipated a crop of grapes. And then that horrible word. Yeah. But. 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 What came out? Wild grapes. Wild grapes. Bad fruit. I want to talk about the vineyard a little bit so that we have a little bit of an understanding from scripture what this vineyard is all about. Nancy, you've got Psalm 80. If you can read that for me, please. Okay, now stop for there, but hold your place because I'm going to have you come back. 
Let me paint the picture in, 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 in Psalm 80. So where did the vines originate? According to that passage, where does the vines originate? Egypt. Let there be absolutely no mistake that the, 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 the vines that we're talking about are God's chosen people. When did the nation of Israel become the nation of Israel? Egypt. When they went to, e when they went to Egypt, originally, they were a family. Right? And it was in Egypt during that time that they were there, and then eventually under, under the captivity in Egypt, they became a mighty nation. And that's where God called the vine out of. He called his people out of Egypt. What did God do to prepare for the vine's arrival? It says that he drove the nations out. Now remember when they went into Kadesh Barnea, that had the chance to go in almost immediately. What did 10 of the spies say when they went into Kadesh Barnea? There were giants in the land. They felt like grasshoppers. Yeah. There were nations in the land, and they said they're like, now they said the land flows with milk and honey, but they're giants, and we're like, we're like grasshoppers. Two of the spies said, no, our God is able. They had the wrong focus. The nation is going to eventually go in. We read it in Joshua. They're encamped at Shittim, and they're looking across, and the two spies are sent in to Jericho. And they go to, whose house do they go to? Rahab. Rahab. And what does Rahab say about the nations? These are the same nations that the ten spies saw and said that they're like giants and we're like grasshoppers. What does Rahab say? is the testimony of the nations. Their hearts have melted. Why? Because they heard about what God did for them. Amen to that. The, God has already prepared these nations to be driven out before they ever even got there. He's melted their hearts. And not only does he drive out the nations, but he clears the ground for the vineyard so that it can go in. And it says that initially, this vine takes deep root. Then it says that he's going to provide the mountains and the trees for shade. He knows the heat of the burning sun and the midday. He's watching out for them. He's taking care of them. And it says that the vines, the branches extended to the seas and the roots all the way to the rivers, they flourish. All right, Nancy, finish that passage, if you would. Why hast thou broken down its hedges, so that all who pass that way pick its fruits? I find that interesting, because there's a question mark after that. Um, well, let's pursue that. First of all, let's make an observation. It started out up through verse 11, talking about God taking the vines out of Egypt, preparing the land, planting them. They nourish, they prosper, they grow. And in those last two verses, the protective hedges are knocked down and the vines are left exposed and vulnerable to destroy. A big change. And then there's this question, why did you do that, oh God? So I'll ask that question. After bringing the vine into the land, planting it, protecting it, nourishing it, seeing it flourish, why does he remove his hand of protection from the vine? Without him, you can do nothing. And, and I, I love both of those answers. Rich, you identified that the people's behavior had become so abhorrent to God that he allowed. And then the truth is that without God, the vines cannot survive. They need God. To, these vines that have become so healthy and so fruitful, they're not going to survive without God. Hosea 10. Kimberly? So 
So this answers the question of why. Nancy observed the question mark. What comes in our, lux our, our luxurious vines, our healthy vines, what ends up is destruction because, because they, they have abandoned God. Jeremiah 2. Without God, you can do nothing. In fact, without God, it's going to go real bad for you. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> The picture again, the choice vine who turned against God. And, and the picture of the vineyard with all of the opportunity and, and all of the uh, care and everything else, yet there is this obligation for the vine, for the people to re remain and abide with God. Ezekiel 15. What's happening to the wood of the vine in that passage? Burned up. It's burned up. It's nothing more than firewood. It's, it's, it's worth nothing more than if you were to walk along the seashore and, and see driftwood. It's worth nothing more than to be burned. And he said, so will happen to you. So will happen to you. My beloved has a vineyard. And this is my love song concerning my vineyard. He cleared the land. He planted choice vines. He set up a watchtower. And he built the wine press so that what really needs to come out will come out uh, of use for him. And he watched for a good crop of grapes. But what he got was bad grapes. Sandy, give me verses 3 to 6, please. Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed. But briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. Thank you. Uh, Dave, I want you to get Second Chronicles ready. Uh, Barb, if you would get John 15 ready. And Revelation 22. Carol, if you would get that ready for me, please. We have a vineyard that God took very specific care to select and to, and, to, and to plant and to nourish and to protect. And, and he expected what he expected but didn't. And so then he comes and he asks this question, judge between me and my vineyard. Judge between me and my vineyard. That's very well said. We choose the vineyards instead of the vine sad. keeper. Yeah. When people do present Christ in some way, they listen, they don't respond. But if I told them I bought something new, you get many, many questions. And I think that shows just how deep Satan has hold. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, I'm not sure how well that got picked up, so I'm going to try to paraphrase it. In our um, so again, Pastor Jeff and I talking this morning that uh, 
Our church is potentially in a situation where we need to go through the fires of God and to be burned, to be purged, to be cleansed, to get the dross out. Uh, that may be what we're heading for. And I rejoice in that. And I say, God, please bring it on. If, it, if that's to happen, that means I need it. That means I need it. The beloved is saying, I gave everything. And in fact, he says, was there anything more that I could have done? Was there anything more than I could have done? Now, instead of getting into a debate on the sovereignty and omnipotence of God, we're obviously not challenging that God was incapable of a different outcome. God, God is sovereign. Please. And he's saying, Deborah. you know, he's reaching out saying, I love you so much. What else can I do? And you keep turning your back on me. It's terrible. It At makes me sad. It makes me want to cry. Absolutely. Bob. It even started back in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, when God created the perfect, and yet it became corrupt. Yes. And it's been that way all throughout history. We see the ebb and flow of God's blessings upon the, his creation, and then the curses because they become sour grapes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What's going on in this phrase isn't a challenge to God's ability to have done more. It's an indictment that the people are blaming their situation and not taking responsibility and acknowledging their sin. Mm -hmm. God has provided the perfect situation for his vineyard, but the vineyard chose to go their own way. And Bob, you're right, it started way back in the... Actually, it started before the garden, it started in the throne of heaven when Lucifer said, I will make myself like the Most High. That's it reminds me of words I've heard come from Pastor Jeff very often, and I remind myself about them. God is just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what he's doing. He could have usurped the free will, but he didn't want to do that. He gave them free will. He didn't want robots. He wanted them to respond from a heart that they loved him. And then he says, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Mm -hmm. Now, again, let's put ourselves into the context in Isaiah. Who is Isaiah? Prophet. 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 Where is he prophesying and when and, and why? Judah. Judah? Judah. And why is he prophesying? Well, he's going to warn of that. There's a lot of things in his, in his, in his uh, prophecy. Well, one of them is, you guys messed up. And there are going to be consequences for what you've done. Bob? Well, I was going to say, as you remember um, early in chapters, they were going through the motions of being religious still. Yes. So they were doing you know, exterior worship and that kind of thing. So that to an outsider, they may have looked like they were doing the things that God wanted And again, because, because none of you are farmers, I get to, to make these statements. Uh, from, <laughs> from a distance, I would imagine it's not easy by the eye from a distance to say that's a good grape, that's a wild grape. From a distance, false worship can look like true worship. <laughs> but it's what's on the inside that's... that's that makes a wild grape a wild grape and not a grape worthy of going into, into, into the wine press. So he's going to say, okay, Isaiah, in addition to the indictments against Israel, gives the answer, and that's the coming Messiah and, and the, the, the kingdom to come. So Isaiah is a book with indictment and hope at the same time. But right now he's going to tell you, this is what I'm going to do to you. And it's because of, of what you've done to me. And, and I'm going to paraphrase the things that Sandy just read. The first thing I'm going to do to you is I'm going to remove the protection. Those hedges 
and all that protection, I'm going to take them down. The second thing he's going to do is he's going to let the vineyard go wild. He's going to stop pruning. He's going to stop cutting out the bad. He's just going to let this vine go, go wild. And then he's going to take away the rain. That life-sustaining nurture that, that the vines needed, he's just going to let it all go away. First Chronicles 14. Dave? Se uh, that too, Second Chronicles 16. The look on Dave's face when I said that was great. It's like when I'm out on, out on the baseball field and I go, he's out! <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. For the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. You have done foolishly in this, for from now on you will have wars. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro seeking those that he may support. The vineyard receives protection from the Lord. But when the vineyard goes bad, the Lord said, I'm going to take that protection away. If, if you read some of these other passages in, uh, in, in Psalm 34, 7, it says, the angels of the Lord encamp around those who fear him. If God's hand is there. We can opt out of it by being obstinate and rebellious against him. The vine is going to grow and the vine needs to be cared for. Um, I, I, I'm going to speak very carefully because I don't have, this is not a green thumb. But I do remember uh, growing up, my mom grew tomatoes. And she would have to clip certain offshoots. She called them suckers. And they're these very lush, healthy looking shoots that won't produce any fruit. Why do you got to cut them out? Because they take the strength from the rest of the plant. They do. They take the strength from the rest of the plant. God is loving enough with us to clip out things that got to get out of the way because they get in the way. Give me uh, John 15, 1 and 2. And what God is saying, what are, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard, I'm going to stop pruning it. And if he's not pruning it, that means those branches that don't bear fruit are going to be allowed to grow and grow and overtake and bear no fruit whatsoever. If God needs, we need God's hand pruning those things in out, out of our lives so that what remains can, can turn to him. Revelation 22 Hmm? And the angel showed me a pure river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Scripture uses this image of, of the water. I'm the living water. Uh, he uses this picture that God nourishes and provides for us, the picture of the water. Revelation 22 is the ultimate, ultimate picture of that water coming right out of the throne of God yeah, in the new Jerusalem. I will even remove the rain. Your, your vines are done. They're going to wither up and they're going to die. Sandy, give me five through seven, please. Five. So now let me tell you what I'm going to I'm sorry, just verse seven. I apologize. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plan. Thus he looked for justice but behold bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold a cry of disaster. Okay, uh, Deborah, if you would get Deuteronomy 28, uh, you're going to get verses 1, 2, and 9 together. Rich, Deborah's going to get Deuteronomy 28, verses 1, 2, and 9. Rich, you're going to get 28, uh, 15, and 58. There's two of them there. And Deuteronomy 28, 63. Christine, Christine, right? Yeah. If, if you would get that. 
Yeah. All of them are Deuteronomy 28. Yes. And what verses 15 and 58? For you, you've got 15 and 58, not through. We'll be here forever. Um, okay. He now tells us what's happening here. He's explaining what he's already told us. The vineyard of the Lord of the hosts is who? It's the house of Israel. If you were ever uncertain about it, he closes that uncertainty down right there. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are what? What are the men of Judah? The planting. So if you have this massive vineyard, that's, that's the house of Israel, and each individual plant are the individuals within that. By the way, the individuals are the ones that need to be pruned. The individuals are the ones that are supposed to be bearing fruit. The individuals are the ones that need the water. All right? And God has already said, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to remove the protection. I'm going to remove the pruning. I'm going to remove the water. Okay, it's the individuals. Now, it says he looked for what? And what did he get? Bloodshed. Bloodshed. It's going to say different things in different versions. Uh, that's pretty much the predominant. And he also looked for what? And instead of that, he got what? Cries for help, distress, outcries. He had, he had brought this choice vine. He had prepared the land. He had planted it. He had nurtured it. By implication, he had been pruning it because it says, I'm going to stop pruning it. He had done all these things for it. And what he wanted to see coming out of it was a good crop of grapes. And now he describes. What is that good crop of grapes? It's justice and it's righteousness. Put in another way, it's the heart. He wanted, he wanted their obedience. Take that all the way back to Isaiah 1. Even when you pray, I won't listen. I'm tired of your meaningless feasts and everything else. Instead of that, he gets something else. Bloodshed and outcry. Going into the Hebrew, it's really kind of clever. He does, he does a little bit of wordplay. And the wordplay is to say, you're pretending, but you're not quite there. If you go into the Hebrew and you see the words that are there, on the outside, they're pretending that they're doing what God would want. But when you really look at it, they're not doing what they wanted. Let's look at the first couplet. Mishapat is justice. That's what God expects. And the people are kind of pretending like we can get close enough with Mishapat. The words are, are very close intentionally that I wanted justice, I wanted Mishapat, but you are giving Mishapat. They're pretending that they're good grapes, but they're wild grapes. And so therefore. And the second one is he wants, wants righteousness, tzedakah. Tzedakah, I'm sorry, tzedakah. And it's tzedakah. It's so close. It's so close. But it's entirely different. They're playing games with God's requirement for them to be just and them to be righteous and coming so close like I can get away with it but God is looking right into them and he's saying no 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 it's not justice it's bloodshed and no 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 it's not righteousness it's disaster it's despair Deuteronomy 28 1 and 2 Those are the promises. He's taken this vineyard and he's given it everything. Just stay, abide in me. These blessings are innumerable. Deuteronomy 28, 15, Rich. But. Uh, that big old word, but. But <laughs> it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully, carefully all his commandments 
and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Absolutely. And, and then, Christine, if you would give me verse 63. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase in number, so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. You will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess. The warning here. Isaiah is starting out with this love song, My Beloved Has a Vineyard. And the, the, the picture that there is this amazing vine keeper who loves and protects and provides for, it ends with a picture of judgment. Now what comes in between is very well described as Rich read in, in, in Deuteronomy 28, if you don't follow me. You know, all these curses are going to come upon you. The nation of Israel had everything they possibly could have had, and they missed one thing, and that was the heart, and therefore God's judgment is going to come upon them. Very, very, very fair of warning, significantly. All right, we're at the time. Are you going to go close it off? Uh, yeah, I can close in prayer. Close in prayer, yeah. yes. So, Father, we thank you so much for giving us everything that we need for life and godliness. Thank you for the provision of Jesus Christ mm. for us. And thank you for your means of grace, the ordinary means of grace that we would be able to walk in righteousness. So we pray that we would avail ourselves of those things, that you would be pleased in our lives, Lord, as we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.